UW360 is proudly supported by BECU, a not-for-profit, member-owned credit union. Pacific Office Automation, copy, print, workflow, and IT. Problem solved. Hi everyone, I'm Carolyn Douglas. Welcome to UW360 and the newly renovated Samuel E. Kelly Ethnic Cultural Center. Later in this episode, we'll tell you more about this center and we'll show you the big opening celebration. We'll also hitch a ride with the Husky Band to see what it takes to get an entire marching band to a bowl game. We'll find out how new residence halls are really changing campus living and check out an app to help you sleep. First, though, a love story that would have had a tragic ending if not for the training offered by Medic One. Getting closer, Brenda. We're getting close. Alan and Brenda should have known each other all their lives. They grew up nearby, knew the same people, but didn't meet until two years ago. We were set up on a date by his father and his stepmom. That blind date turned into a love story. By summer, Brenda and Alan were spending every day together. <laughs> on one sunny July afternoon, they headed for Brenda's favorite beach. It was gonna be a picnic. And it was really warm, really sunny. And Alan was up here. So then the uh, chest pain started, where it was tightness in the chest, and then I started to get uh, extremely hot. Medic 11815 ALS, Lower Lagoon Beach Park in Nordland. And he kept like, you know, pounding on his chest, and he was like, I got heartburn or something, I just don't feel good. Male in the 40s, plenty of chest pain, keep your on progress. As Alan collapsed onto the sand, he was still trying to tell Brenda he could fight off the pain. So I was laying my head on his chest, trying to hear his heartbeat, and I couldn't hardly hear anything. And, um, and I said, Alan, your heart's not beating. Brenda will tell you I probably died at least once at the beach. Shortly after medics arrived, Alan's heart stopped. We sat on the monitor, and we shocked him right away and he woke up. Launch airlift northwest. As they waited for helicopter transport to Seattle, medics gave Alan medication to open up a blocked artery. It's a protocol not often used in the field. It uh, blew the clot in the area and he reperfused and we were able to get him to the helicopter and to Seattle. Medics working in rural Washington counties, like the East Jefferson Fire Rescue Team, face challenges their big city colleagues don't, like longer drive time to a hospital. There may also be limited resources for enhanced training. And that's where the Medic One Foundation steps in. They provide funding so that medics can be trained by UW Medicine at Harborview, where Medic One was started by UW physicians. It benefits communities around the state. They contribute 100% uh, of the uh, cost of tuition, uh, which allows us to, to send people to Harborview and the uh, University of Washington School of Medicine training. Um, otherwise, uh, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to do that. Training at Harborview helps ensure that people throughout Washington receive the same high level of service when they need it most. In Jefferson County, 60% of its medics were trained at Harborview. It gave them the background they needed to save Alan Thomas's life. The training that the Medic One Foundation has helped us provide for the citizen has stepped up the level of care that, that is uh, available. Um, many, not too many years ago, um, actually, um, we didn't have a very good um, cardiac arrest um, statistics in terms of surviving. That's changing now, thanks to the Medic One Foundation and Brenda and Alan just might spend the rest of their lives together. I tell them all the time, 
that I just remember every day how valuable his life is. I mean, all of our lives, actually. For more about the Medic One Foundation and the training they support, you'll find a link on our website, uwtv.org slash uw360. And up next, another kind of love story, the deep bond shared by the very committed members of the Husky Marching Band as UW360 continues. Welcome back, everyone. There's an old joke that goes, what does it take to get to Carnegie Hall? Practice. But practice is just a fraction of what it takes to get the entire Husky marching band to a bowl game. Take a look. OK, but that was much better. As much space as you can give me between those eight, those sousaphones. All right, let's do it again, gang. When we're first teaching a show, it is a bit like moving moves heard around me. They're just learning their spots. Since that's what this band is known for, is it's energetic and, and fast-paced drill. Most of the time, they, they're amazing at how fast they, they remember things and, and how quickly they are, they are at brushing out the cobwebs and, and uh, really cleaning the show. Husky band director Brad McDavid is overseeing the final practice before his team heads to the Mako Bowl in Las Vegas. It was a show that we did at the very beginning of the season, but we're taking a much smaller band to the bowl game, so we've had to, I've had to rewrite it, and we've had to essentially reteach it to most of those kids. The Husky band is steeped in tradition, from its retro high-stepping style and uniforms to field assistant Don Sabo on the sidelines. It's my 40th season. I was in the band for nine years. My job basically is what we put on paper to try to make sure it gets onto the field. And in those 40 seasons, Don says he's seen things go wrong on the road. We had a saxophone, $4,000 saxophone run over by a bus. One of my favorite stories, we had two rookie percussionists that were left in Spokane after the Apple Bowl because they overslept. Despite the risk of being left behind, four hour practices like this one, followed by the next day's early morning plane takeoff, there are no complaints about road trips from this band. But it's totally worth it. We get to play so much and get to go on so many trips and have so many unique experiences. The practices are definitely long and tiring, but the bowl game definitely makes it worth it. Out-of-town trips are definitely long and tiring for the band's staff, about two dozen strong. We have about 150 hats that we're taking. We've packed those into nine bigger boxes. Scheduling the flights, scheduling the food, the hotels, all that's just travel. And then of course there's figuring out what we as a band need to take to function as a band. And so we're bringing things like ladders for the field shows, we're bringing a sound system for rehearsal. I mean, because nothing ever goes exactly according to plan, and so you have to be able to figure out how to make it work with what you've got. Everyone and everything is assembled by 4.30 the next morning for the bus caravan to SeaTac Airport. Please follow along as we demonstrate. Despite the early hour, the Husky Band rallies for their famous airplane takeoff performance. Fasten your seatbelt by inserting the flat metal end into the buckle. Pull the loose end of the strap to tighten. Lift on the top plate of the buckle to release the seatbelt. On arrival in Las Vegas, it's about 24 hours to the Mako Bowl kickoff. The band, cheer squad, and mascot have one rehearsal, a few pregame performance obligations, then the big day. No rest for the weary, the band heads straight to the airport after the game. But no matter how tired, tradition must be upheld. Unfortunately, the Huskies lost the Mako Bowl, but as you can see, the band returned in high spirits for next season. And maybe that's partly because they have such a great campus to return to. Student living has come a long way at the UW. Today's updated residence halls offer much more than just a place to sleep and study. They're really creating entire new communities for students. College has always offered a very special opportunity. 
getting to live in a parent-free environment, and make new friends. Conversation at dinner ranges from sports and the present productions at campus theaters to world events and study. 50 years ago, Haggett was the latest word in residence halls at the University of Washington. But as enrollment grew and buildings aged, living spaces on campus became overcrowded and kind of shabby. So for many students, on-campus housing just wasn't an option. Now that's changing. We have many more choices and options for them. And that means that a student can um, join our residential communities as a first year student and potentially stay with us throughout and find a different style of accommodation for every year that they're, they're with us. The UW is four years into a decade long building plan for residences. Funding for the project is based on future rentals, so the design reflects what students will be willing and able to pay. And so that's the first thing we do. We test unit types, rental rates, and ask students what their preferences are. But nowadays, students want you know, a place to study, they want good dining, they want to be able to meet people. And if you come to these buildings in the evening, you'll see all of these areas full with people doing a variety of things, and it's really exciting, it's very really engaging. Students living in residence halls are more connected to campus, and these new spaces are designed to promote a feeling of community. So we have amenities like a grocery store, a restaurants, but also the student groups have uh, resources like group study rooms, places where we bring in tutoring for after hours, kinds of uh, needs for students, uh, game centers, fitness centers. There are areas for groups to work on projects together, combining study space with living space. Students often have a project where they're working with uh, a lot of different uh, disciplines and they need space to do that, whether that's bench space to collaborate on actually sort of building something or just a table to set their computer up and, and uh, visualize the same screen together and talk about whatever they're, whatever they're doing. Students can seek out people with similar interests when choosing where to live. We have a bunch of different themed communities spread out all over the buildings, so we've got honors, we've got them by major, so like business and arts and engineering communities. We have them by living preferences, so there is a sustainability committee right over in Poplar. Sustainability is an integral part of the overall design. Students can walk almost everywhere, and energy efficiency in the buildings is key. We're hitting between 40 and 60 percent less energy use in these buildings compared to like buildings built at this same time period. Finally, while communal living has many benefits, students also appreciate having a little more privacy in the new spaces, which are more like small apartments than traditional dorms. We have our own bathrooms in the room, so you don't have to deal with like fighting eight other people or however many for a shower in the morning. I really love that they have a kitchen that has a full two stove tops and a lot of room to just eat and cook. Well, I moved here from Haggett Hall on the other side of campus just this last week at the start of this quarter, so this is incredibly nicer. Brother, please. Enjoy your meal. Pretty wonderful. Yeah. Stay with us. We'll be right back with an app designed to help all of us sleep-deprived folks get a little more shut-eye. We'll be right back. Welcome back to UW 360. We all know one of the most important things we can do for our mental and physical health is get enough sleep. But we still have all kinds of reasons why we don't. So now there's actually an app for your phone to help. So we've got TV, we've got work, we've got surfing the web, we've got reading, homework, email. They are activities we do every day. The question is, how does it affect perhaps the most important activity of all? our sleep. And so there's a number of recommendations from the sleep community about what times of day it's appropriate to drink things like caffeinated beverages or eat a large meal or um, engage in physical activity or consume alcohol. Julie Keentz, an adjunct assistant professor in the UWI school, and Jared Bauer, a PhD student, have worked with other faculty and with Intel Labs Seattle to develop an application for Android-powered mobile phones that can help people who suffer from insomnia. It's called Shut Eye. 
Shut-Eye is an application that is designed for end users to try and get them more aware of the, the things that they do throughout the day that can have an impact on their sleep. Those things could include anything from drinking alcohol too late at night to Seattle's favorite pastime, drinking coffee. Caffeine um, can stay in your system between 8 and 14 hours um, after you consume it. Um, so they really recommend that um, you, you count back from your bedtime and you know, make sure if, if it really strongly affects you that you're not drinking it 14 hours before you go to bed, which for some people that can be as early as, as 10 a.m., 11 a.m. But Shut Eye reminds us when it's suitable to drink certain beverages, take a nap, or even eat dinner. An active wallpaper display on Android-based mobile phones provides recommendations about common activities that impact sleep. Julie Keentz and Jared Bauer worked with doctors and researchers at the UW Sleep Center at Harborview Medical Center to get the latest findings about activities that affect sleep. The results? Shut-Eye gave users a better understanding of the activities that keep them up all night. It may not have directly changed everyone's behavior, but at least they were more aware of the potential effects. So they had a, a sense of, okay, I am drinking this cup of coffee, I know it might impact my sleep, but I'm at least aware of it. So it's really about promoting awareness. For coffee drinkers like Anna Sexauer, knowing when to curb her caffeine intake is important. I usually wake up around 6.30 and I probably have my first cup around 7.30. Anna isn't drinking caffeine in the afternoon anymore because Shut Eye reminds her when to stop. She's had it on her mobile phone for the past eight months. It's a visual way to represent when um, the activities that I do during the day are going to affect my sleep. I think it has helped. I can really tell the difference when I'm trying to fall asleep. I fall asleep faster, I'm more relaxed um, when I'm ready to go to bed. For anyone having trouble falling asleep, it's safe to say Shut Eye is a welcome relief. You'll find a link to more information about Shut Eye on our website. And stay tuned for a big party around an important piece of history as UW 360 continues. Welcome back, everyone. In 1972, the UW's Ethnic Cultural Center opened in response to student demands for greater diversity on campus. It was intended to provide a nurturing environment to support students and to enhance their academic performance. Forty years and thousands of students later, it was time to rebuild and rename this center after one unforgettable man. It was a night to toast new beginnings. Cheers. Thank you. And to remember a man who is very hard to forget. He was a presence. Definitely a presence. Whenever he walked into the room, people knew he was there. It was a celebration of the newly rebuilt and renamed Samuel E. Kelly Ethnic Cultural Center at the University of Washington. Dr. Kelly was the UW's first Vice President for Minority Affairs. He was a man who got what he wanted. He always was a person of vision. Whatever he started, uh, he, he always saw what it was going to be way down the line. So he always saw opportunity. He didn't see closed doors. Well, one of the things that Dr. Sam was really adamant about was that students, when they came to the University of Washington, that we would not make them give up their ethnic and cultural identity. That we would create a home away from home for them where they could always connect to their ethnicity and community but also then share that richness with the rest of campus. The Kelly Ethnic Cultural Center, or ECC, has always been about the students. In 1968, a group of young idealists stepped up to do battle for social justice and racial diversity at the UW. It was the beginning of profound change on campus. The University of Washington has a commitment to diversity that is a part of the fabric of the institution. We are strongly committed to making sure that we uphold the legacy of what the ECC has been and now what the Kelly Ethnic Cultural Center will be, which is, you know, going to continue to evolve. Today, 40% of UW undergraduate students are people of color, and the ECC serves nearly 90 student organizations. 
growth made rebuilding inevitable, and students, once again, played a vital part in the plans. They're the ones that really um, drove, the, drove the design um, and, and how they wanted to use the space. So there's a lot of wall space uh, where they can put their artwork. We also wanted a space where they could collaborate. So the workspace is central, it's open. Office spaces are designed to be flexible, allowing them to adapt as needs change. There's a wellness center, a computer lab, and a dance studio. And it's a social place as well. Architect Alex Reluda, himself a former Husky, remembered the ECC's impact on his life. You know, you go to a classroom of, of 200 students and thinking, wow, this is, this is something else. And you just gotta just uh, decompress and get away from that. And if you can't make it home, this is, this is the place to go. While making changes, the past was preserved. 22 murals from the original ECC, some by 1960s artists like Eddie Walker and Emilio Aguayo, were restored and displayed in places of honor. These paintings mean more than just color and, and paintbrushes, you know? You can't find anything like this on campus, even in mostly Seattle. As the activists of 1968 envisioned, students here are developing the skills to be tomorrow's leaders. We have the Leadership Lab, which is a new program uh, that it allows students to have hands-on, um, taking that theory about leadership and putting it into practice. The other piece is the education part. Uh, our goal at the ECC when it started was to get students to graduation day, and that's a part of our core mission that's going to continue. If you're a freshman, get involved, get involved, get involved. Uh, school is really important, but a lot of the reason why I'm so connected, a lot of the reason why I'm so successful academically and socially is because places like the ECC. So the vision takes on new life in a new home. And Sam Kelly would have been very proud. He would have loved it. And he would have been so thrilled with all the people who are here today. He would have just, you know, partied on. <laughs>